2017. Tonight is a review uh, of a book by Abraham Tversky. Uh, I think it's a fantastic book, even if your child is not ex experiencing addictive behaviors. Like I always say, when we talk about alcoholism or addiction, it's helpful if you translate it or substitute in the phrase self-sabotaging behavior, you know, dangerous behavior, unhealthy behavior. The, the, the funny kind of metaphor that I use to talk about it in my family is I'll talk about somebody being a drunk. And I'm not talking about them being literally drunk, but I'm talking about the kind of thinking that goes into it. And so this is really a disease of thinking. Right, where, where we're unable to, to rationally make decisions. What makes sense to us um, is that two plus two doesn't equal four when we're living in the addictive mindset. And all of us can relate to that. Think about those times in your life when you've been full of rage or think about those issues that you've had in your life where you're, you're not able to think rationally. That's what it means to have an addictive mind. And the same is true with codependency. One of the most important points that we all talk about tonight in the broadcast is how similar the addiction to substances is with the addiction to trying to control, control somebody else in our lives. So with that preamble, let me get right to it. Um, he talks about this idea again about it being a, a, an addiction, being a disease of thinking, right? And, and when we can identify the thinking errors, we don't get trapped by them as, as a loved one. We don't try to argue with the drunk person because you can't argue with somebody that's being irrational, that's, that's changing the frame constantly. He talks about this idea. It really feeds well into to what we teach, which is that communication matters. What we say matters. It's not the solution necessarily, our, our communication pattern, but it does invite a different kind of thinking. So using the I feel statements, using a set of communication starts to teach us, starts to give us a way of thinking that's a much healthier way. Changing our thoughts through the use of intentional language. We talk about in this program, avoiding things like imperatives, you know, should, ought to, must, need to. Being able to identify distorted thinking, thinking errors. There's a webinar on that. And also using I feel statements are all ways of changing from an irrational, addictive type of mindset to a rational one. And I'm going to say this very clearly. This is speaking to both the addict and the codependent, right? We can fall into the exact same traps as our loved ones who suffer from addictions and from other mental health, health issues. The most important thing is the invitation to, to heal ourselves in the process. You know, the, the best thing that you can do for your loved ones, and I think all of you who attend these webinars know this, is make your mental health your priority. The world is a better place when you're practicing healthy self-care, when you're focusing on your own serenity, and when you're making your life your project and not making everybody else's life your project. Confrontation is careful observation and reflection. You know, there's this treatment center, this old TC model, where confrontation was dramatic and, and, and loud and even had an edge to it. And he talks about it more from the, the perspective of the motivational interviewing model. That's a book and some research based on how to challenge somebody by, by more about observation. Confront somebody with, you're saying you want to be a doctor, but you don't like biology. Right? You're saying you want to be healthy and fit, but you're, you don't want to exercise or cut out some carbs or some, some desserts in your diet. Right? It's, it's that kind of confrontation. Self-deception, uh, the lies that we tell ourselves to justify our behavior. And, and this book, what he's talking about is this way that we justify, the many ways that we justify, rationalize our behavior, and, and becoming familiar with that, that way of thinking so that we can begin to think in healthier, more rational ways. AA calls it stinking thinking, and it's a core feature of the disease of addiction. It's, 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 and, and cognitive behavioral therapies, they would call it irrational beliefs or thinking errors. And it's hard because as parents, I think we want to come in very quickly, very uh, precisely to identify our child's thinking errors. But sometimes we're not the best person to do it. Sometimes we have alternative motives. Like when my child is angry at me, I want to talk him out of his feelings. If I'm uncomfortable with anger, 
I want to talk him out of anger. If it's too hard for me to allow her to feel sad, I want to tell her how her, her negative thinking, her, her thinking error is at the core of her sadness. That's a problem because as a parent, I have a dog in that fight. I have an investment. I have a conflict of interest. A therapist or a mentor or a coach can come along in a more neutral, more detached way and do that same kind of work. So it takes a lot of practice as, as a loved one, a lot of practice as a parent to be able to, to detach enough that we can be helpful in that process. Remember this, he says, for it is important. Identification of addictive thinking must come from outside the attic. They're, they're going to have a hard time. He makes a case for intervention. He makes a case for this idea that we don't just stand passively by with our children and, and, and wait for them to hit bottom. But we have boundaries. We have limits. You know, an employer can fire you, can require you to go to EAP or to treatment. A spouse can say, I can't have this in my home anymore. A parent can say, here are my limits and my boundaries. So we can do things to intervene. We can help to raise the bottom, if you will. The immediacy of the high is the best predictor of, a, of its addictiveness. You know, what makes something, what, what makes an activity or, or a substance addictive? And there's a, an example in there that if you took a pill, no matter how high it gave you, it didn't kick in for 24 hours. It's less likely to be addictive. So, so he defines what, what makes something addictive, and it is the, the, the connection between the activity or, or the ingestion and the high. Right? The quicker it happens, the, the higher you go in a shorter period of time, the more addictive it is. I also think that there's a relationship between the amount of energy it takes to put into an activity versus what you get out of it. Right? Exercise can be addicting. Work can be addicting. Reading can be addicting. But what makes those less addicting than, say, crack cocaine or sex is that you have to put some work or effort into those things to get a payoff. So it's, it's effort, it's time-related, um, and it's the, the high that, that also is uh, realized in, in that process. Uh, the, a culture within an addict's concept of time. He says, we've polluted the air, rivers, and oceans for short-term gain, disregarding long-range effects. We've destroyed forests and other habitats of endangered species with little regard for turning, it, for turning this world over to future generations. Are we not disregarding the future very much as the addict does? He tries to help us see, and this is so important in, in, our, in our work as systems therapists, right, understanding the system. He tries to help us to see how we have addictive behaviors as a culture. And what that does for you when you read this paragraph, and this paragraph was written a long time ago, long before we're, we're currently engaging the debates around global warming and man's contribution to it, human contribution to it, is the idea that we all can relate to it. Right? You, you can pick things closer to home, but our culture has this, right? We're, we're playing the short game in a lot of our lives. In fact, one of the things I've been talking to families about that I, that I do some of my work with is this idea that if you play the long game, if you let go of the short game, you're looking for the, the long-term outcome, you're going to make different decisions. But it's hard for us to do that. We want the reward. We want it now. We want the payoff. We want to win the battle. We have a hard time seeing the war and the big picture. In 12-step work, they, they offer the frame, offer the mantra as, one day at a time for today. For today, this is what I can do. Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the next right step. Right? The, how long have you been sober? How long have you been uh, thinking well? Well, the question is, what time did you get up today? It's just for today. Can you do the next right thing? Right? Those are all in contrast to us trying to swallow the big pill, get everything resolved, manage all of of life's challenges coming down the pike, if you will. The definition of addiction, addiction he offers is this. The most convincing theory on how addictive thinking develops was presented in, 1983, in a 1983 article by Dr. David Sedlak. Sedlak describes addictive thinking as a person's inability to make consistently healthy decisions 
in his or her own behalf. He points out that this is not a moral failure of a person's willpower, but rather a disease of will and the inability to use will. You can think about it from a brain structure, right? We know the people have, that have experienced trauma, that have had poor attachment in their life. They have a hard time accessing the, the frontal, the top areas of their brain. They're in this constant lower brain cycle of fight or flight. And, and to say that everybody's on equal ground, everybody's in the starting gate at, at the same place, isn't fair when we think about trauma or addiction. Or, or any predisposition, or anything that, that affects a human being's brain. And to take it out of the moral language, to take it out of the moral frame, offers more compassion. We get less frustrated. We, we can become more detached, less angry in the process. And, and we do believe, from the research that we have, that, that, that there is an addictive gene, that it is genetic. That there's a predisposition. Of course, exposure to and the environment can exacerbate that predisposition or, or can mitigate or minimize it, but it exists. The peculiar, peculiarity, he says, of addictive thinking is the inability to reason with oneself. Right? The, 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 the addict, the alcoholic, blames the police officer for getting a DUI. The addict or the alcoholic blames parents for being too rigid, for overreacting. The addict blames his wife for calling the police and getting a domestic violence arrest. Right? They find ways to justify, to rationalize, and not to reason and take responsibility. The three most common elements in addictive thinking are denial, rationalization, and projection. Right? So, so to, to assume that an addict is, is capable without outside intervention at, at looking at and getting themselves out of this is to assume that the brain somehow is going to change itself without any intervention. It, it, it's not through confrontation, right? It's not through arguing and debating, which is what most codependents engage in, right? They're trying to argue with a drunk mind. Awareness of unconscious processes and defense must precede changing them. Right? There has to be a, an awakening in the process. And that often can come by consequences. I was talking with some parents this week about this idea. A couple of set of parents that I was working with, and they were talking about their great fear about their child getting arrested. And, and, and while nobody hopes for that, the reality of that is maybe that's what the child needs. I don't know. Maybe waking up in a jail cell, maybe being in a, arrested is what they need. I don't know. So that, that's an example of not knowing somebody else's truth. Still, you're going to proceed with, if you need to call the police because you feel unsafe or you're not okay with the boundaries that are being violated or, or, or what have you, but, but you let go of the outcome of that process. Rationalization and projection reinforce denial and preserve the status quo. It's, it's an amazing thing that the addicted mind can rationalize some of these examples. A fairly reliable rule of thumb is that when people offer more than one reason for doing something, they are probably rationalizing. Usually the true reason for an addict, for any action, is a single one. I actually remember this when I was in grade school. I think it was Walter Mondale. I'm not sure who said, I think he was an attorney. Might have been somebody else. But he said, uh, if you have more than one excuse, as a, as a defense attorney, you have none. Right? And, and, and so that's just, that's just common sense. You can't say, in a, in a defense, for example, of a murder, I was, I was out of my mind and insane, and I wasn't there. Right? That starts to look kind of strange. There's only one of those defenses that you need. So coming up with multiple excuses. Either or thinking, black and white thinking, dogmatic thinking, fundamentalism, right? All of those are examples. That, that, that rigidity, that, inimil, that inability to embrace b the both, to embrace the dialectics, right? The, the non-addictive brain is flexible, sees the gray in things, can embrace both. That old idea of if you're not for me or you're against me, 
That's an example of either or thinking. Thinking, right? It, it's a rigid way of protecting oneself from the distress that comes when we have to embrace the both. He talks about at the core of this issue is a low sense of self-worth. The foundation of addiction is low self-worth. The irrational belief is that one is worthless or valueless, and it's often covered up by grandiosities, right? I remember when I was 16, my therapist told me, a superiority complex always covers up an inferiority complex, always. If I know I'm okay, I don't have to tell anybody that. I don't ever have to tell anybody that I have a nose on my face. It never occurs to me to have that need. How do you treat grandiosity? First, you see the intrinsic value in them. I have a webinar and wrote a blog on what is narcissism. And narcissism is a wound, right? Grandiosity is born out of a narcissistic wound. It's not about overvaluing the child. It's about valuing the wrong thing in the child, valuing their accomplishments, right? their goodness rather than valuing their intrinsic worth in the process. You listen and connect. The hard part about this, the hard part about this is the children, the people in our lives who, who need the most love are often ones that, that, that are the hardest to give it to. They do so well. They do so well at pushing people away, at exhausting people, at getting people to react to them. Finding ways, you know, catching our children and doing something right. There's, there's a lot of benefit. That's, that's a lot of what therapy is. It's validating. Right? Somebody says the, 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 this, this thing that, that's so hard to listen to, and the therapist says, I can see how that makes sense to you. That becomes the foundation on which some of that confrontation that I was describing earlier can, can be built upon. But first and foremost, listening to them, seeing their strengths. I listed a couple of links here. You might take a moment to, to, to uh, write these down, write these, these links down. One is in the Huffington Post and one is a YouTube video, but it's the same thing. And I've talked about it. It's the, it's the rat experiments, the cocaine and heroin experience in the 1980s and later in the 2000s, where they, they changed the rat experiments from these rats being in cages and being addicted to cocaine and heroin, and they put them in rat parks where they had other rats and places to have families and toys to play on. And what they found is that rats in the cages became addicted to the cocaine or the heroin until they overdosed. Rats in the rat park actually began to shun the cocaine and the heroin water. And rats that were introduced into the rat park who were physiologically addicted to cocaine and heroin got themselves off of it without any treatment whatsoever. So the idea is the problem is the cage, right? The problem is the disconnection, the sense of alienation, the sense of, of, of the loss of, of, of passion, the loss of life, the loss of connection. He concludes that addiction, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, but rather connection. And so what does that tell us for those of us who love our, our, our addicts, our drunks, our, our children who struggle? It tells us that we have to find a way to connection. And, and that's hard to do with someone that's using. It really challenges a lot of what we think about when we think about reacting to somebody with an addiction or, or a problem in our life. What happens at Evoke is that you get a timeout. Your child gets taken care of. It's, it's much easier for the staff and the therapist here to take care of your children than it is a parent. Being a staff or a therapist is a hundred times easier than being a parent me included. So, so they're getting taken care of, they're getting connected, they're getting supported, they're safe from themselves, and then you take this time out and you begin to feed yourself. You begin to transform. You develop greater capacity so that you can learn to connect to them. And then when they come home or get out of the program and they struggle, you have more flexibility. You have more capacity in that relationship because you're committed to doing your own work. You're committed to self-care. You're committed to getting your needs met somewhere else than from your child in that process. So that's what this, these experiments, these articles suggest to us, invite us to do in our lives. Um, rock bottom. 
Changing addicts' perspective. People quit drinking the same reason they start, to feel better. Rock bottom is nothing more than a change of perception, where abstinence is seen as a lesser distress than the use of chemicals. And, and in some ways, some of what we do with intervention is, is raise that bottom, right? That's what happens when you get a DUI for some people or when some people lose their marriage or, or when some people uh, get fired from a job, right? All of a sudden, non-use becomes, although it's uncomfortable, becomes more appealing than use for the same reason. It's the same reason that the addict started using, which is using felt better than non-using. And relapse doesn't have to be back to square one. I've heard people describe it as flare-ups and then full-blown relapse, where they're back in their old thinking. I think that's important as parents that we distinguish between the two, that we can see a hot spot or a flare-up, but that a child has not, or anybody for that matter, has not devolved to the point that they're back in their old ways of thinking, which sometimes they do. And if we can learn again to see the gray in this process, we contribute to a, a healthier way of thinking in the system. Therapists, sponsors, and mentors can help us recognize our relapses and our old thinking, right? And therapists are different than sponsors. Mentors are different than, than both. Sponsors tend to be very directive. Right? And you have to work hard or they don't they don't want to waste their time. They're not getting paid for it. Therapists, on the other hand, ideally have more capacity. The deal in therapy is you show up, end of deal. You don't have to do a certain if you find your therapist getting frustrated, exasperated, upset with you, then you know he or she is doing their work in the therapy and it's not your work. It's not your therapy anymore. Manipulation, often it looks like flight to health, I'm fixed, I'm cured, right? That's a, that's a rationalization. Oftentimes, that, that's evidence in a family that, that the paradigm is about good and bad and right and wrong. When the child apologizes and promises that they'll never do it again, then you can see the value in the family is about right and wrong and apology. I don't need an apology for your addiction. Of course I'm worried about you. Of course it hurts to, to watch you. Of course some of the things you've done to me in your addiction are, are hurtful. But that's not the thing. So to apologize for me is a little bit off. Guilt and shame, of course, are critical. Guilt and shame are, are, are short game, right? They're not the long game. They're powerful short-term mo motivators that have absolutely devastating and, and, and deteriorous effects on, on the psyche, on the self. It's often those things that addicts are medicating is guilt and shame. And it's so counterintuitive because we've seen guilt and shame have an effect in people's lives and even our lives where good choices are made in that context. But we know long-term it's not sustainable. The illusions of control, right? This idea that we can control, that if I, if I can figure out the right levers, the right buttons to push, if I can do the right thing, always that, that's the addictive thinking of the codependent, the others in, in our lives, right? It's up to me to get it perfectly right. I can make it happen. It doesn't matter what you do. Once you're in that mindset, you're in your disease. Admitting mistakes and promptly admitting mistakes, modeling and owning it. That's what you do. But that, that's hard because that's surrender. I encourage parents as often as possible to apologize. Look, I've been guilting you. Or look, I've been making you responsible for my feelings. I've even put it on you. I've been getting in your circle. Right? Find ways to apologize and model vulnerability. That's essentially what we're asking, sometimes trying to force to happen with our children. Anger, resentment, victimhood, repression, you know, letting go, owning all of that in ourselves. He has this idea about porcupines. You know, the porcupines, they're hard, the addicts are like porcupines. They're hard to love. 
They're hard to hug. You know, the walls that they put up, pushing everybody out of their lives to try to medicate against the guilt, the shame, the responsibility, the hurt. They feel so responsible for everybody if they can just go away. That's why it's incumbent upon us as parents and loved ones to make our serenity our responsibility so we don't contribute to this erroneous idea that our children are responsible for our happiness. The problem of pain, it's that old story that I tell that pain isn't a problem. It's not something to, to, to try to fix. It's something to feel and work through. It's something that saves us. It's something that teaches us. It's something that helps us grow and transform. Helps develop compassion in us. It lets us know that we're alive. But so often in our culture and in our lives, we treat praying like it's a problem to be fixed, especially in our children, because of our own empathic misery. Depression, brain chemistry, medication, exercise and diet, and distorted expectations. The distorted expectations, excuse me. Right? These are all comorbid with, connected to addiction. And, and the, the antidote in wellness therapy is exercise, being outside, away from electronics, sleep, healthy diet, challenging thinking errors, getting the, the self and the psyche clear. The problem is, is that for so many addicts and, and people that suffer from mental illness, the mental illness lies to you, tells you what not to do. Depressed people don't want to go out. They don't want to exercise. Right? Addicts want to isolate more and more and more. Tversky talks about it, and most people talk about it being a spiritual disease. Drugs replicate the spiritual deficit that the addict feels, that sense of connection and transcendence with the divine that fills the individual with meaning, peace, love, and transcendence. It's a sense of well-being that you have about being alive, being in the universe. Many people describe that in relationship to a higher power. And he makes, in the 12-step programs, make a very clear distinction that being religious, having a practice, a religious practice, is not the same as being, as being spiritual. That being spiritual is coming into contact with the divine, coming into contact with that sense that I am okay, right? In my most spiritual experiences in my life, which oftentimes, to be clear with you, have happened in therapy, both as a client and as a therapist, the number one feeling, thought that comes to my mind is, I'm okay, everything's okay. That's what the addict is looking for. But for them, they can't accomplish it. It eludes them. But drugs give them that sense. That's what, think about that. Think about, I imagine most of you on this phone call have had a drink where you're stressed out. And you go from stressing out and worrying to, ah, oh, it's no big deal. Everything will be okay. That's what the addict needs to do, needs to feel all the time because they can't get it any other way. There, there's a lot that suggests that the addicts are extra sensitive. People talk about that a lot. You know, you know, when you have a sunburn, it seems like everybody is trying to hurt you. You know, they pat you. Some you get patted on the back, you bump into somebody. It's that kind of emotional sensitivity. And, and you know, we can't see people's emotional scars. They're not visible. But they're there. I saw somebody talking about somebody and saying that person can't possibly have a reason to be an addict or to be a narcissist because they haven't experienced any emotional distress. And I thought, and this was a this was actually a, a clinician saying this, kind of a world famous clinician. And I thought to myself, you have no idea. It's so much more. Subtle. You can't compare somebody's outsides to your insides. You can't look at somebody's highlight reel and think that you know them. The core issue with codependency is obsession and control. A codependent person is one who has let another person's behavior affect him or her and who's obsessed with controlling that person's behavior. The word obsessed is a good red flag for me. I find that when I'm obsessed with something, with somebody, that I'm in my codependency. And as a therapist, you can imagine it's a, it's, a, it's a critical practice to look at one's codependency. It'd be very easy to mask your codependency. It's like a, 
alcoholic becoming a bartender or a drug addict becoming a doctor who can scribe. It's the perfect breeding ground being a therapist is for, for being a codependent. And it's well hidden. And the same way codependents will not conclude that since efforts to stop the addict have been futile, there's no way out of controlling the addict. Rather, they look at new ways that will work. I mean, that's just how an alcoholic thinks, right? Or an addict thinks. They just keep finding new ways to use, new excuses, new coping. They organize their entire life around. Codependents similarly think, I got to find a new way. I'm going to find the magic bullet. I can cure this. It is my responsibility. The worst part of this is, as they get reinforced for the small wins. Right? They have moments where they step in and solve the problem. And they're reinforced internally and externally. But they're not playing the long game of helping the addict figure it out for themselves. Not letting go enough for the addict to fight their own battles. A compulsive act can be irrational, yet the urge to do it may be virtually irresistible. Trying to resist the urge can produce so much anxiety and discomfort that the individual may give in to it simply to get relief from the intense pressure. I cannot tell you how common, almost universal it is, for a parent to say, I know it's not the right thing to do, but. I know I'm not supposed to link lecture, but. I know I'm not supposed to fill in the blank, but. If you can finish that sentence, if you can relate to it, and, and I don't mean to be flippant or sarcastic, unless you're perfect. Most people will say to me, I get this said to me every day. The, the thing I get said to me every day is I know it in my head, but I'm not able to do it. Right? If that's true, if you can relate to that, you can relate to what it means to be an addict or an alcoholic. You can have empathy for them. Be humble with them. Share with them your own struggle with addiction. Even if it's not around substances. Even if you're around addicted if, even if yours is around being addicted to other people. The three C's that they talk about in Al-Anon, that Tversky shares, is you did not cause it, you cannot control it, and you cannot cure it. Adopting those as a mantra, as a practice. I, I hear this all the time with, with parents. I have nothing in common with the people in Al-Anon. Right? It's the same excuses that people have not to go to Al-Anon, that they have not to go to AA. I hear the same excuses from parents about why they don't want to go to the six Al-Anon or CODA meetings that we ask you to go to, that your children are giving us in the field about why this program isn't necessary and why they don't have a problem and how everybody else is different from them and how they don't need help and they can manage themselves. They can do it without this support. Right? When we try to convince addicts of the fallacy of their thinking, it's like telling someone that his or her belief in the law of gravity is a delusion. It is the height of futility to expect an addictive thinker to abandon that concept of reality and accept ours instead. Addicts must lose faith in their current reasoning power, and they must accept the, response, the possibility of another version of reality from someone they trust. That's that moment of surrender. That's that moment when I realized my best thinking isn't working. I'm almost willing to try something else. That's that, you know, it's, it's the story of the Nine Rusty Armor and the Letters of Juliet, two books that we recommend to, to children and to parents. In, in each of those journeys, when the Knight or, or Juliet were at their lowest is when they became open to the teacher, when the teacher appeared. The mother of a young man who was destroying himself with alcohol and other drugs could not understand how he could be oblivious to the disastrous effects that chemicals were having on his life. She asked for help in dealing with him. But, she said, don't tell me I have to put him out of the house or that I should not bail him out of jail, she said. I don't want to hear that. I responded, please tell me how much two plus two is, but don't say four. She had been unable to see that her own thinking was no less distorted than her son's. I, I, it's a powerful, powerful paragraph. It's a powerful invitation for us to turn the focus away from our child. That's the solution. And I'm telling you this. I'm, I'm telling you this. The solution is to address your disease. And that's a strong word. But address your issues. The best thing you can do to help your child is to work on you. 
All right. Practice communication skills. That's the basics, right? That's where you start. That's where you kind of fake it till you make it. That's where you practice something that's a tool that can eventually change you. Go to therapy, 12-step meetings, and make your serenity your project. Um, recovery from substances is not just abstinence but it's also a change in the way that we think. And recovery and codependency, it, it, our behavior changes as it relates to others, but it changes in the way that we think about our relationship to others and their problems. And that is, that can, that can sometimes require some support, that can require a mentor, that can require a, a practice, a mantra, a meditation, that can require reading, podcasts, slogans, a sponsor, 12-step means it can require all those things. All right. First question, can I recommend this book to my daughter? She's in aftercare right now. Be careful of that. I would suggest to the therapist that you saw a webinar on a book that you thought may be helpful and let it go. Codependents tend to want to recommend books to other people to fix them. What might be even more helpful? And it's a great book. But what might be even more helpful is you writing a letter to your daughter saying, I was reading about addictive thinking and I realized that I'm addicted, that I have an addiction problem. Mine isn't to substances. Mine is trying to change and control you. That's what I would write. That's what I would do. Next question. If I'm actively participating in a 12-step program and attend weekly meetings of NA, should I be attending other, any other types of 12-step groups? That's a fantastic question. And let me give you my my two cents on it since you asked. I think one of the most underused ideas is that addicts who are in 12 steps don't go to CODA or don't go to Al-Anon. They have meetings that are called double winner meetings, like you, you've won twice. That can be helpful. But Al-Anon and CODA is the pure addiction, right? There's not even a, a substance. It's just another person. And I cannot tell you how I am so dumbfounded sometimes, and that's why I'm glad you're asking, that I've met with addicts who are phenomenally, seriously codependent and have no clue even what it is. I think codependency is at the heart of or the core of many people's addictions. So that's a long-winded way of saying, I would invite you to do that. Yes, try that six times. My son just walked out of, next question, my son just walked out of an alternative sentence treatment option after a week. I am practicing detachment, searching for my own serenity. It is so challenging just to let go. Any supportive words? Thank you for the webinar. I think the thing I would say, it was something I was saying to, to a friend yesterday, which is um, we don't know how the story is going to end. I know a lot of fantastic stories. I've, sent a lot, I've sat in, in a lot of Al-Anon and AA meetings and NA meetings and other meetings where I've heard somebody tell the story of several relapses, getting arrested twice, three times, 19 rehabs, 19 detoxes, whatever it is, serving time in Rikers jail, detoxing from heroin in prison, all of that. And these stories are told by people who are in a powerful spiritual recovery, who are running treatment programs who have successful families and careers. And, and, and I give you those stories. I don't know how your, your child's story is going to end, but that's a possibility. And you don't know how to make it happen. You can only work on loving them, being as connected to them as you can, being as clear with your self-care, with your focus as you can. Watch the YouTube. Please, all of you, watch the YouTube. It'll be a 15-minute YouTube TED Talk that I shared with you earlier tonight on addiction and connection. And I'll just go back up to that so you have that while I'm answering the rest of the questions, if you want to write that down. Next question. Earlier this evening, did you say that there is a connection between addiction and, and one's genetic makeup? Absolutely. The research is overwhelming, that it runs in families. Twin studies, adoption studies, addiction has a genetic component. There are other factors that contribute to it for sure but we know it has a genetic component next question our daughter is realizing that her way of thinking isn't working for her anymore specifically the lying the faking who she is the de defiant behavior 
She has been in a wilderness and a therapeutic boarding school since May. She used to. Oh, I got to move this little box. She used to love to read. What book would be best for her as she begins to learn who she isn't and is now trying to find herself? Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Way of the Peaceful Warrior is a fantastic book. The, the, my ten, in fact, maybe I'll list this on my Evoke page. If you go to drbradreedy.com on the book tab, I have my 10 favorite books. Those are just mine. I love Night in Rusty Armor. I think it's a wonderful allegory. I think it's a fantastic self-discovery. Some people love The Alchemist. Way of the Peaceful Warrior is another good one. Um, the Chosen, I've heard, it, for some, is, is a favorite. Um, maybe share with her one that, that has helped you. Say, this has helped me. I mean, this is the way we offer it. Instead of telling somebody what to read, we say, this was helpful to me. It may or may not be helpful to you. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions, so I'll just go through some of the announcements. All right, here are the 12 step support groups alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, naranon.org, alateen.org for teenagers, also nami.org is another one. You can listen to, you can offer the podcast to friends and relatives on the podcast app on your iOS device. Search Evoke Therapy Programs. If, you're an, if you have an Android device, download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram, not just for inspirational quotes, but also for announcements and activities. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs. Um, you can also go to the Second Nature Alumni Foundation uh, on Facebook. Also, Saving Teens, I'm going to include this on upcoming slides. Savingteens.org is a fantastic organization that helps people who can't afford therapy and therapy to treatment. You can go to our blog. We have a wonderful blog on 12 Steps that was just uh, published by our returning therapist, Tim Mullins. A fantastic one about recovery in the wild. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon and also barnesandnoble.com. You can also get audio versions of it. Go to the Parent Alumni Foundation book page on Amazon, part of the Amazon Smiles program, and a percentage of the proceeds of all the books that are there recommended by our therapists go to charity to, to help people who can't afford treatment. Parent support groups upcoming. We have several upcoming. I have one in D.C. Uh, we have one in Toronto coming up. We have one in Chicago coming up. But the ones that we have most immediately are Los Angeles on March 26th, 4 to 5 potluck, 5 to 7 meeting. Please RSVP to Andrea at evoketherapy.com. And um, then the Bay Area the following night at Nearwood IOP in San Rafael, March 27th. Upcoming workshops, we would like all families that are able to go to workshops to go to one of the workshops while their children are with us. If you want to do deeper work, I think we have one spot left in the Finding You in March. So if you're interested in that, that's to do deeper personal work. That's the one that I run. Six participants, three staff, four days. A lot of deep work. Pursuits are adventure trips for families. So if you want to do something fun and therapy light, or if your young adult children want to do something for some sober fun, high adventure, you can actually pick anyone. We have scheduled trips, but you can be, pick any outdoor activity. And our guides, our therapeutic guides can take you through that. Support you, but mostly have fun. All right, any, any other questions before I wrap up? Stephanie? All right, folks, thank you for joining us. I hope these are helpful. I'm going to be on vacation next week, so I'm looking forward to that with the family. And then I will be back on Monday, March 13th. Be sure to look at the archives and also the podcast archives to, to listen to those while I'm gone. I'll be back with a new topic on Monday, March 13th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Have a great week, folks. Take care, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.